So the last panel, uh, we started to have a discussion about the connection between uh, financial regulation, bank supervision, and monetary policy. And so it, it seems only appropriate that now we're going to focus on the question of financial regulation and monetary policy. I'm Stephen Haber. I'm chairing uh, this panel. I'm delighted to uh, be moderating a panel composed of my colleagues Emmett Saru from Stanford University, Carol Duffy from Stanford University, Christina Parajon Skinner from University of Pennsylvania, and Carolyn Wilkins from the Bank of England. Um, we're going to start with uh, Amit. Uh, each uh, presenter will uh, make some uh, brief remarks, uh, and uh, then we will throw uh, discussion open to the floor. Amit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Too Many Rules and Too Much Discretion and maybe a plea for simplifying financial regulation. Uh, so the monetary policy, uh, of, which is in the title of the session, obviously affects financial stability uh, through many channels, but, you know, for example, through the value of the long duration assets, the credit risk in the intermediation sector. And if you think about the financial stability, uh, the biggest challenge that we have is that the banking system is highly levered. Here is all the banks in the financial system, size on the x-axis, debt to assets on the y-axis. Pretty much bank of any size has 90% uh, debt in their capital structure. What that means is small shocks to asset values uh, could be higher rates in monetary cycle in 2023 or credit risk in 2007. Uh, we end up with basically a situation of many banks in insolvency. Uh, in turn, this imposes a constraint on monetary policy. Ross mentioned a discussion that we had in the early part of 2022, uh, which was on the same theme. So whether it's the uh, constraint on the how much rates can be raised because it might affect the banking sector or uh, keeping the rates low after the Great Recession, uh, you get the idea. Now, not surprisingly, we've had a bunch of regulations passed many complex, towards getting financial stability in place, most aggressively post-Great Recession. And we can ask how successful we have been, and we can revisit this uh, just to get a glimpse. So here is the banking system. Uh, and just in case you're not familiar, on the asset side, we have 24 trillion uh, spread across securities, loans, and so on. Uh, on the liability side, we have, of course, insured deposits, that's nine trillion, but then we have nine trillion of uninsured deposits and also this two trillion dollar of equity capital that we'll talk about. Now, one thing which is interesting to see is to see what happened over the last year. Uh, rates rose, a value of assets fell, uh, long duration assets, when they fall, there is mark to market losses that might build up in the system. Uh, we did that. Uh, and try to evaluate how much was it. Turned out it was larger than we thought, so we called it turbulence. Uh, what did I mean by turbulence? Well, it was about $2 trillion in the system. Uh, now, $2 trillion is an interesting number because it effectively wipes off the equity in the system. Um, and unlike the stress in the banking system in 2007, which was all about illiquid assets, illiquid loans, this was about liquid securities. More than 60% of this was in liquid securities. Uh, now, you might ask, is this only concentrated in a few banks in the West Coast? Uh, here is a distribution of uh, losses in the system, mark-to-market losses uh, over assets on the x-axis. And you can see the vertical line is where Silicon Valley Bank is. There are quite a few banks below in terms of losses, but many, many above as well. Uh, that was one insight, uh, but the other interesting insight, and this is the reason why we had been studying this well before, was when you think about stability, you've got to think about flight risk related to uninsured leverage. Uh, so why is uninsured leverage interesting and important? Hopefully it's clear to everyone after the fall of SVB, but 
The idea is how much uninsured deposits you have on your capital structure because uninsured depositors, well, are uninsured, so they have maximal incentives to run if there are losses or spookiness in the system. Recall that there were nine trillion uninsured deposits in the system, so it was not one or two banks. How were they spread out? Quite a bit in the system. The vertical line here is SVB. So yes, SVB was an outlier, but there were many others with pretty high uninsured uh, leverage in the system, so there was a lot of flight risk in the system. So uh, what we did was if you put flight risk together with turbulence, uh, you start seeing that they might be susceptible to a different kind of run than we are used to. Uh, you can call this a solvency run because it's based on liquid assets. So if the interest rates rise and your value of liquid securities, liquid loans falls, and you don't have enough capital in your system and you have a bunch of uninsured depositors who might get spooked, you could get something known as a solvency run equilibrium. And the question was how much are we talking about in the system standing uh, a year ago and maybe today as well because nothing has really changed uh, besides that we have backed everything. Uh, so you could do uh, turbulence, mark to market uh, losses on the y-axis, uh, high versus low. And you can do flight risk, uninsured leverage in the system, high and low, and ask where is the, how many banks in the system are insolvent or potentially insolvent. And each dot that I'm going to show you is potentially insolvent because if you look at the mark to market losses and you assume a few uninsured depositors run because they're spooked, they are runnable, uh, insured depositors would not be paid. And here is the system, each dot is a bank, there are 4,800 banks in the U.S. system. This is about 2,000 banks that I'm plotting. Each dot, the size, represents the assets. So the biggest dot is a GSIP. That's $1 trillion of assets. But there are lots and lots of banks out there. That's Silicon Valley Bank, but there's a ton others that you also see. So you could ask, we did all the rules and regulations post-2007. Where was financial regulation? And I have, everybody has a story, I have mine too. And I think there are two potential issues with doing a lot of rules which are pretty complex. First is, if these rules are directed towards the last war, anything that is inside your toolkit uh, looks like a hammer and you're gonna use it towards the nail. So we diagnosed this as a liquidity run. And as a result, there were many, many liquidity injections, but yet banks have continued to fail, whether it's First Republic or now Republic First, doesn't matter. Uh, there are lots and lots of these banks in the system. We have backstopped everyone, mind you, so it's nothing is free. This is going to show up at a future date, but we are still not able to do what we thought we would do. So that's the first set of issues. The second issue is if you sort of have complex rules and you have fragmented responsibility like we have in the U.S. and everywhere in the world, really, institutional incentives can conflict and create sluggishness in the system. And so the question is, is there a lot of discretion in the system when it comes to supervision and regulation? We had a debate in the last panel whether there is a lot of uh, discretion. And the answer is there is actually quite a bit of discretion. So one simple way of thinking about it is to look at this thing called a camel's rating. Camel's rating is looking at each parameter like capital, asset quality, management quality, and so on, rated between one to five. One is pretty good, five is pretty bad, and some of these variables when regulation happens and supervision happens have more discretion when it comes to a bank regulator. And really, there is a composite rating that's constructed again between one and five, evaluating, hey, is this a bank good or bad? Because all policy decisions from deposit insurance to pretty much expansion, if it's allowed, is all something that goes through camels. So what we did was to ask, in the composite rating, what component contributes to each? And what we found that 50% of the variation in CAMEL's rating that are given by supervisors in the US right now are based on M, which, as you can imagine, has a lot of discretion. So you could ask, but does this discretion, which is quite a bit, really matter? And there are many ways to look at it, but I'll give you two. One is, Lots of banks in the U.S. system are regulated in tandem by state and federal regulators. And for various reasons we can get into. The advantage is that for a given bank, virtually at the same time, you can get a rating from state and Fed 
which you can then compare. And what do you find? Well, here is what you find. Uh, what is plotted is again camels on the y-axis and spells on the x-axis. White bars is when the state is supervising you and giving a camel's rating, and gray is when the Fed is regulating you and giving you a rating. Now, when the states come in, they reduce the camel's rating. When the Feds come in, they increase the camel's rating. And the state's ratings are actually in line with whenever forbearance incentives in the local economy are very large. So that tells you discretion exists is exercised, but you can really say, does this really matter? Let me show you that same picture before that I showed you about insolvency in the system with color coding now. The red dots here, and SVB should also be red, uh, are all state chartered banks where that kind of thing that I showed you before exists. You can do visual least squares, but this seems to me that there is a lot of discretion because of forbearance that's going on, which is contributing to why we may have not acted in the first place. So what's the solution? How do we get to financial stability in this system? Remember, I told you that banks are very highly levered. My proposal is that we have a way of doing this in a very simple way, actually. Many people have sort of talked about this. We actually have entities right now doing a lot of activity, banking activity, exactly like banks, but they are called shadow banks or private credit providers with complete uninsured capital structure. Uh, and what do they do? How much capital structure do they have? We can sort of look at them and get some idea. And here is what you find. This is the debt in the capital structure of shadow banks who are providing the same activity as banks. This is in the $12 trillion mortgage market, substantially lower than banks, especially if you look at middle to small banks, which is, by the way, where a big chunk of the regional current crisis exists. That tells you something about subsidy there. So if that's the case, why haven't we done it? Well, whenever there's a conversation about, hey, raise capital, because that seems like the right thing to do to absorb losses, there is the issue that, well, but this is going to lead to a drop in lending. And the question is, does it do that? Because there are substantial changes that have happened in the intermediation sector in the last many, many decades. I will only focus on two. First, banks don't just originate and keep the loans on the books. Increasingly, as their health in the economy has gone down, they actually originate to distribute. So that means banks' activity should not be just captured and focused on by looking at the bank balance sheet. Second, there is a rise of private credit which exists. I showed you shadow banks which are doing the same activity with much higher equity in the capital structure. So the question then that we see in the Basel endgame debate is, is the total lending going to be affected? We actually ran that experiment. We put banks and shadow banks together, run that equilibrium, let them compete, and saw what would happen to change in total lending. So if you started with the baseline capital in the system, in the banking sector, and said, hey, we are going to raise capital requirements, a few things happen. First, as you would expect, the balance sheet does get constrained. You're making it expensive, so the lending falls. What is plotted is what's the change in lending. But that's on the balance sheet. That's not all banks. When you add on top of that what banks do in terms of also selling, the line changes. The total lending gets dampened. The total activity is actually not falling as much as you might have imagined by the blue line. But that's not all. We also have shadow banks and some of the activity migrates to shadow banks. So now you are raising capital substantially. Mind you, Basel III is all about raising 6% to 6.12% or 6.15%. And I have raised the capital quite a bit. But you see very limited change in the total lending. This was mortgage market, of course. Does this apply uniformly in the system? And the answer is yes, because if you look at more broadly what's happened in the banking sector, there has been a decline of bank balance sheet lending over many, many years. We just have not paid attention. Uh, you can look at how much activity is on the bank balance sheet in terms of lending and how much is happening in the private credit market. You put these things together, you can run the same experiment of raising capital requirements and what do you find? something which is very similar to what I showed you before, that the total lending doesn't fall by that much. So if that's the concern, 
I don't think that's the problem. So let me conclude. I said that I'm going to talk about many rules, a lot of discretion, and maybe simplifying financial regulation. I think the answer is in front of us. So we can simplify financial regulation very simply. All we have to do is ask banks to raise higher equity. It's simple. We know they can provide banking services with this change. A lot of private market and shadow banking already does so. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. Thanks, John, John, Mike. <clears throat> it's a, a terrific presentations today. I want to talk about some uh, new research, new results uh, with Adam Copeland at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and Elin Yang, who was in our doctoral program. He's now in Hong Kong. Uh, and it's about how post-crisis uh, financial regulations have increased the minimum size of the Fed's balance sheet, which is clearly an issue related to monetary policy and financial regulation, our topic for today. Uh, I'm sure everyone or almost everyone in the room has uh, noticed that this week the Federal Open Market Committee decided to slow down the reduction of its balance sheet. And uh, for some, that might seem a little surprising. What? I, you know, I thought the inflation job was not done yet. Maybe we shouldn't be uh, providing uh, uh, that kind of accommodation, having a large balance sheet. But this is not about monetary policy accommodation with the assets uh, owned by the Fed. It's rather uh, that the Federal Reserve learned back in 2019 that uh, banks need a certain amount of cash held at the Fed to run the financial system. Uh, and if they don't have that cash, uh, things, bad things can happen in terms of funding markets. So I want to explain uh, what I just said. Uh, you, you can think of this kind of like uh, the Fed is landing this big airplane uh, onto a runway, if you don't mind the metaphor, but it's foggy and it's not exactly sure uh, how far down it is to the runway and it wants to land very carefully. In September 2019, it landed and it was a big bump uh, because it landed very quickly and funding markets were not able to deal with having so low amount of cash held by banks at the Fed. And so this time around, uh, the Fed has announced, it was part of the FOMC announcement, that they want to start earlier and go slower with this landing. So they're going to take a longer runway and land slower so they don't bounce on the runway if they bounce at all. Here's the bounce that happened last time. Uh, I'll take a minute to explain this chart. On the left-hand side is the spread between interest rates negotiated in funding markets. This is called SOFR, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, and the interest rate paid by the Fed on bank balances. So that spread is used as a gauge of how tight uh, reserve balances are. And on the right-hand side of the axis, on the right-hand axis, you're seeing the total uh, reserve balances, not in the entire banking system, but the balances held at the 10 most active money center banks that are providing wholesale funding in markets. Uh, so you can think of these, uh, well, you know the household names, uh, the Wall Street names that are providing this funding. And uh, the FOMC also discussed the fact that it wants to go slow because it wants to make sure that the balances are being held in the right places in the financial system. And the funding markets are basically intermediated by these 10 largest dealer banks. Now let's take a look at what happened uh, as, as the Fed's balance sheet declined uh, beginning uh, around 2018, the balances held at these 10 largest banks were not that great. And you can see the big spike in September 2019 in funding market spreads when basically funding markets could not deal uh, with that low level of balances. And in fact, in intraday, uh, the spread jumped to 1,000 basis points in the interdealer market, and it was quite a disruption. Actually, there's a lot of other little bumps in the red line that don't seem very noticeable in this chart, but they're considered very, very large uh, disruptions in funding markets, and those continued until the COVID shock. And as a byproduct of the COVID shock, the Fed had to buy an enormous number of treasuries 
And that pumped up reserve balances at the, at the banks. The banks held much more cash at the Fed. And these bumps in the red line stopped. There was no more disruption in funding markets. And there has not been ever since, because there's been abundant reserves. And now we're getting to the point again where the Fed is bringing down the balance sheet of, and reducing the amount of reserves in the system. And it wants to do that very carefully. Another chart, I'm only going to show four slides. so. Focus on this one. This one has the major part of the story. How those funds are distributed in the banking system matters a lot, as the Fed has said. On the horizontal axis is the opening of day balances of the next 90 largest banks in the system. So remember, the top 10 are those banks that are intermediating wholesale funding markets. And the next 90, their balances are on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is how late in the day those 10 critical money center banks are getting paid during the day by the other 90 banks. Uh, you can see a pretty clear relationship. Uh, when the other banks have low balances, the critical 10 banks are getting paid later in the day. The R squared is about 69%. And if you have really good color sight, I don't, I'm colorblind, you'll see some little red dots up in the left corner of this scatter plot, those are the days on which those funding market disruptions were greatest. The spreads between the repo rates in wholesale markets, that's a $4 trillion a day market, and the interest rate paid by the Fed on balances skyrocketed on the, dot, on the red dotted days. Notice they're clustered up on the left top, and the top left red dot is that day in September 2019 when funding rates skyrocketed. So there's a clear relationship here. That's, uh, we also use all kinds of quantile regressions and probit analysis and other kinds of regressions in our paper to show that when the system has too low balances, that is insufficient balances, these money center banks are getting paid too late in the day and then they provide funding to others at excessively high rates. Let me run a little experiment. Suppose you all have 10 little plastic poker chips, and I give you a random list of 10 other people in the room to whom you have to pay 50 poker chips today. So you have to pay out five times as much as your initial stash of poker chips. And you might say, well, how would I do that? Well, of course, others are paying you poker chips during the day. So if you wait long enough, you'll eventually have enough poker chips to pay the other folks, all 50. But of course, if everybody waits, that's a problem because nobody's going to get their chips until everybody else pays their chips. I think you all have the mental image. Now in the middle of this, uh, Steve Davis over here calls John Cochran, uh, let's say early in the morning, and says, John, I want to borrow some money in the repo market. I'm really in need of funding. And, and I'm going to tell John, no, today you only have five chips, John. And John says, whoa, normally I have 10. Today my balances are only five. Steve's calling me for funding. I'm probably not going to get very many chips until later in the day because everybody else is paying late because the chips are low. So I'm going to give Steve a ridiculously high funding uh, quote and then Steve's going to be very disappointed. He might not even uh, like uh, the idea of borrowing money at this high rate, and you know, other, other bad things can happen. So I think you all have kind of a mental image of why having enough uh, chips in, uh, uh, spread around the room or why banks having enough cash held at the Fed is critical for running the financial system. Not only do you all have to make payments to each other, but many critical 10 of you, like John, are being asked to provide wholesale funding to markets. OK, so why don't we just find out what's the minimum level of chips in the system to make this work? And that's basically where the Fed is kind of feeling its way down as it lands this plane, sort of mixed, meta mixed metaphors. Uh, it wants to feel its way to what's the minimum level. But this is kind of an instrument landing situation where it would be nice to have another instrument. And that's what I'm going to be showing you. So first, the elevation of the runway in this metaphor is very uncertain because the structure of the financial system is changing all the time. Financial regulations are changing. 
the Basel III endgame is going to change the minimum capital requirements of the bank, which play a role in this. The, we just discussed last year that uh, the Fed needs to actually increase the amount of liquidity that uh, banks have in order to meet their demands from uninsured depositors in a bank run. And we talked about the fact that uh, maybe this can be mitigated by pre-positioning collateral at the Fed so that the banks won't have to rely so much on reserves. There are many other uh, changes going on all the time, and it's very difficult to know what's the minimum level of reserves. Again, that's why the Fed is going slower this time. There are some costs associated with a large balance sheet, and these have been pointed out to me many times. I say, you know, Bill Nelson is here, Charlie Plosser is here. They've written very effectively on the cost side. And it is costly for the Fed to have a large balance sheet. It raises the volatility of its income and it causes uh, the Fed to have a larger footprint in, in money markets. On the other hand, uh, there's costs going the other way. If there's not enough balances in the system, we can get these disruptions. Uh, the Fed's reputation for being, a, being in control of the situation can be reduced. Uh, financial stability, you know, maybe Steve Dave Davis really needed that funding and maybe he's not gonna be able to roll it over today and he might have to go belly up. Uh, so these, these stresses also count, and the Fed can't really afford to take many chances, and I think that explains why the FOMC made the decision that it made this week. So what about my last slide? What about this early warning sign? Uh, not, if you don't know exactly how far down the runway is and it's in the fog, maybe you need another instrument. And so in our new results, we show that if you look back over the last 10 days, and you see how late in the day these big money center banks like John Cochran are getting their funding. If they're getting it later and later in the day, you kind of know that they're going to be reluctant to lend money at competitive, normal uh, rates. And they're gonna, uh, it's going to be a disruptive situation. So in the horizontal axis here, you're looking at time. On the vertical axis is the time of day by which those 10 most active funding market banks have received half of their incoming payments. And that's relative to normal. So 100 on this scale is 100 minutes late. 100 minutes late, that's a warning sign. You've got to stop. The, vertical, the first vertical line on the chart is that bad day in September 2019 when funding rates skyrocketed by hundreds of basis points. And you can see that this was building, you could, if you, maybe if we had done this research earlier, not delayed so long and doing our work, the Fed could have seen, ah, oh, look, uh, this is an early warning sign. Look at all those regressions, uh, look at the quantile work, look at the probit analysis. You can see that uh, if the lagging 10 day time of day by which John and the other nine money center banks are getting paid is getting late, like more than 50 minutes late, then you've got to pull up the airplane, stop reducing the amount of cash balances uh, that are uh, available to the banks or uh, suffer some of the costs. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Okay, so I would in fact like to use the opportunity of this panel to take a really big step back, also continuing on some of the themes from the earlier panel, and do some very big picture thinking about the structure and governance of supervision regulation at the Fed. And I wanna specifically think about why SNR policy and function is different from monetary policy and why we should care. Okay, so in 1962, Milton Friedman gave us one of the earliest conceptualizations of central bank independence in his very well-known essay, Should There Be an Independent Monetary Authority? And Friedman's notion in that essay about central bank independence really focused on a monetary structure that was, quote, free from government tinkering. And in its purest form, it would also be free of the control, the direct control of the legislature. Now, as this audience very well knows, in the ensuing decades, 
The idea of central bank independence really took hold around the world, became the established norm, and even legally speaking, those central banks like the Bank of England that had previously been under more direct control and supervision by the government gained their formal legal operational independence in the 90s as well. Now, as this audience also very well knows, if we if, you know, fast forward then 10 years after the 2008 financial crisis, major central banks around the world gained significantly expanded supervisory authority. And most importantly, for the purpose of my remarks today, central banks like the Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, gained and assumed these vast macro prudential or financial stability powers. And so, you know, we know that the question of whether central banks should also act as bank supervisors has been debated, debated for many decades. One thing that really hasn't been properly questioned is whether central bank supervision should be entitled to the same kind of operational independence that the central bank's monetary policy function is. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to repose and rephrase Milton's question here, which is should there be an independent central bank supervisory authority that's, that's really free from government tinkering? And this question is especially timely right now because globally, central banking supervision has evolved tremendously since 2010 to be extremely prophylactic, precautionary, and intense, while largely rejecting the tenets of cost-benefit analysis. While, on the other hand, domestically, the US Supreme Court is hard at work re-examining the legitimacy of the administrative state and financial regulatory agencies, their governance, their structure is really in the spotlight. And so the Fed does need to be prepared to confront these questions and to think about how its own policy decisions might eventually invite more judicial scrutiny. And I'd also like to point out that there are certainly questions of policy optimality at stake here too. The Fed, like other major central banks, is going to continue to face these trade-offs that we've alluded to in various panels between its statutory monetary policy goals and its assumed financial stability goals. Now, so legislatures, the public, people at the Fed really need to reflect critically on whether its current structure and governance is best equipped to help it navigate those choices. So I'll summarize the argument in the paper that I've prepared for, for today which is the following. Central bankers have so far more or less assumed that the core economic concept around central bank independence, operational independence, has automatically extended to central bankers' supervisory authorities. And in essence, this has been used to justify expansive discretion to develop a battery of new regulation and supervision under the heading of macroprudential policy. However, a central bank's supervisory role really is quite distinct from its monetary policy role in at least five important ways. First, supervision and regulation is a coercive power of the state. Monetary policy is not. Second, the Fed's mandates for safety and soundness, and even more so its assumed responsibility to pursue financial stability confers, again, a tremendous amount of discretion. And even much more so than what's involved in price stability because we simply cannot, again, measure those objectives and there's no obvious benchmark for doing so. Third, supervisory and regulatory policies have been made to align with global standards that are set by the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision, but that process has no democratic accountability. And fourth, since the Fed has expanded its supervisory policy and domain in 2010, that policy has in fact often tracked the administration's goals. And fifth, the vice chair for supervision is the only member of the Board of Governors that essentially enjoys a policy fiefdom with the legislative authority to set the supervisory and regulatory agenda and a commitment of deference from the chair. So I want to suggest to you that in coming up with this structure and governance regime, like Congress did in 2010, we a little bit put the policy cart before the legal 
course, because whether this question of policy optimality is best served by combining financial stability and monetary policy under one roof within a central bank can really only be answered after settling the constitutional issues that are in play. So I want to spend my remaining time talking to you about we why we can't continue to assume that the Fed's supervisory function can be afforded the same manner of super independence that we give the Fed's monetary policy function. And then I'll talk just very quickly about some possible governance and structural fixes or things to consider. So one of the most significant structural changes that the Dodd-Frank Act imposed on the Federal Reserve System was creating this role of the vice chair for supervision, who's also a member of the Board of Governors. As such, the vice chair enjoys the same personal badges of independence as the other members of the Board of Governors, most notably protection from removal from office. So a president can only remove a sitting member of the Board of Governors for cause. And while that term has never really been adjudicated or defined, most legal experts think that for cause can't mean for policy disagreements. Now, it's also a little bit unclear whether for cause applies to the role of the vice chair for supervision or it just applies to your role as a member of the Board of Governors. But a lot of legal experts opined that it did, in fact, apply to the role of the chair and the vice chair the last time a sitting president flirted with the idea of removing the chair. However, recent Supreme Court precedent calls this assumption deeply into question. In a case called Celia Law, the court considered the removal protection that was given to the head of the CFPB, and it underscored that the take care clause in the Constitution means that the president's power to remove and therefore be able to effectively supervise his officers extends to anyone who wields significant executive power. And this is required by Article II of the Constitution, and it is the rule, not the exception. Now, the only exceptions for that rule are twofold. For one, a group of principal officers exercising this power, or so-called inferior officers who are really performing more ministerial, not executive tasks. But we know that supervisory policy at the board is again, in effect, set under the direction of a single director now, the vice chair for supervision, given the extent to which this person is setting the agenda, having deference from the chair. And the Basel III endgame proposal is the perfect example of the consequences of this arrangement. The supervisory and regulatory power of the Fed board is certainly also executive, not ministerial in nature. So Fed supervision is promulgating rules which are costly and burdensome on the banking industry. It's imposing significant supervisory requirements like stress testing. And if warranted, the Fed supervisory function is engaging in a range of formal and informal enforcement actions. And this manner of coercive power is paradigmatic example of executive power. Now, the separation of powers problem that I'm pointing out here is exacerbated by the fact that the vice chair for supervision enjoys so much discretion. So again, neither the terms financial stability nor safety and soundness have any definition in law, nor have the agencies attempted to promulgate a definition of those terms themselves or discern when financial stability might be achieved. And so naturally this has become a moving target and one that the Fed supervisory function is free to define for itself. Now, the clearest example that I'm going to give you here is in regard to the central bank and greening policy. So for many years, central banks have been pressured to engage in a wide range of greening, to use their tools basically to facilitate a transition to a lower carbon economy. And in many cases, particularly in the United States, this was used as an effort to end run a slow or reluctant legislature. Now this was thorny for the Fed from the start because the Fed does not have any mandate to pursue sustainability goals, unlike the ECB where that's referenced in the context of its mandate. And it has no obligation to have regard to the economic policy of government like the Bank of England. Now, Chair Powell did eventually admit this in regard to the monetary policy function, but supervision and regulation have been a much more convenient area to direct toward greening, especially under the heading of financial stability risk. And the Fed has taken action here. It's established two different supervisory committees to think about retooling supervision toward climate risk and banks. 
It's piloted a climate scenario, sort of stress testing light uh, example policy, and it's promulgated supervisory guidance around climate risk and banks. But this really begs the question, what definition of financial stability risk are we using, to, are we using here? Up until this point, it seemed as though, at least, the Fed had been using a definition of financial stability risk that assumed some kind of credit risk lurking on big, ba big bank balance sheets that if and when that credit risk materialized, it would so destabilize ba one bank or more banks that we would in turn destabilize the financial system. But if you looked at the big banks, all of the GCFE's balance sheets in 2021 when this initiative started, less than 5% of their balance sheets were exposed to heavy carbon producers and their equity capital levels were two or three times that amount, which suggests that even if you had to write off every one of those loans, these banks, unlikely, these banks would still have been plenty solvent. And the narrative around physical risk was even less compelling given how geographically and sectorally diverse these banks were and the fact that cloud computing has now eliminated the risk of single point of failure as a form of operational risk. So again, if the definition of financial stability risk has changed somehow, the public deserves to know why it's changed and how. After all, the Constitution specifically limits how much Article 1, that is legislative power, Congress can delegate to an agency, which really should prohibit the central bank from being a policy entrepreneur. After all, there are a number of rule of law problems in this scenario where the Fed supervisory function has a wide berth to take up new problems under the heading of financial stability risk. For one, as I've alluded to, this is clearly an end run around Congress, which is democratically illegitimate. Two, there becomes this erosion between the distinction between monetary and fiscal policy. So doing things that work structural transformations of the economy or undertaking supervisory and regulatory policy that functions like a tax on certain activities, these are fiscal functions that haven't been delegated from Congress to the Fed. Third, it suggests that when Congress is inert, the Fed can just respond to the administration's wishes and do this in the interest of expedience. And clearly, there's really the proverbial slippery slope that we might slide down here, because one can imagine any number of problems that can fall into this bucket if you give the Fed the power to identify new financial stability risks with no limitation on the hypothetical character of the risk or parameters around time horizon. So this really leads one to a few conclusions, but maybe more so just a few ideas. First, as a constitutional matter, it's very hard to escape the conclusion that the vice chair for supervision is removable at will by the president and that this is not an affront to central bank independence. Second, we might consider options for structural separation at the Board of Governors between monetary policy and supervision. And third, it is worth thinking about how we can improve accountability to Congress across the system, the Federal Reserve System given the private nature of the reserve banks who are implementing supervisory policy on a day-to-day -day basis, Congress may have too much of an obstructed line of sight into these supervisory decisions, and I think we did see this clearly in the case of SVB. Now, it would be a different story if the reserve banks were acting like private self-regulatory organizations like they did in the clearinghouse days. Maybe there would then be an argument that Congress does have no business looking there. But today, they, in, they increasingly implement stringent supervisory policy made by the board, and this does weaken the exemption from certain reporting and transparency requirements. So I will leave it there, and I look forward to your thoughts. Well, hello, and it's uh, my turn to uh, thank the organizers for the, for the invitation. You know, I'm always looking for places uh, where I'm going to hear things that are quite different from what I usually hear, and this is definitely it. Um, and so. And so, uh, and quite refreshingly so. So what I thought I would do is maybe something a little bit different from the, the rest of the presenters and, and speak about a specific case where financial stability issues uh, and how we would deal with them needed to be coordinated and be compatible with what monetary was, policy was doing at the time. Because I think this is really a, the LDI example, the um, liability-driven investment example in the UK is one area where you can really practically speaking look at how this, how this plays out. Um, and so, 
you know, I just want to start off by making it clear that this isn't really the first time that we've been thinking about the implications of interest rates or monetary policy for financial stability. Uh, we've been thinking about it for a long time, and if you just roll back 20 years, uh, which isn't that long ago, we were all worried about low for long. Uh, we were doing research, many of you were in the room, on the merits of leaning against the wind, the merits of cleaning after asset price bubbles, and that turned after the global financial crisis into worries that were quite different. In fact, that in fact, compressed risk premia and, uh, and a term premia would result in a snapback in interest rates and cause financial stability concerns on that dimension. A lot of work was done there at stress testing. Some of you remember the FSB work, um, but it was done pretty much everywhere. And in fact, it's interesting because a version of this actually occurred, except for it wasn't through uh, a blowout in, in term premium, it was through monetary policy tightening, and quite rightly so, to get inflation under control. And, and I say rightly so just because that's a central bank's mandate, but clearly uh, getting inflation under control uh, is just a prerequisite for financial stability. But at the same time, the transition to those higher rates, especially at speed, can create stresses in the financial system and uncover vulnerabilities, which is exactly what, what we've seen. Um, and so I wanted to talk quickly about the dog that, that did not bark in the UK because it's a far, form of account, accountability about what, what actually kind of did work. And then I'll get into, spend most of my time on the dog that did. Um, it more than barked, it, it bit, and that's the LDI crisis. So try to draw some lessons from that, which I think um, I think we can use taking forward in future work. So, so clearly there was an issue with SVB. Um, it was touched on briefly, so I don't need to explain why it's all well known. But it wasn't something that occurred uh, in the U in the UK at the time. And in fact, the UK banks were quite resilient to the rather steep increases in interest rates coming from monetary policy, as well as the big spike in interest rates uh, in October 22, which I'll, I'll get to then. Um, and uh, you know, the question is why? Well, there are probably many reasons why, but I would point to the fact that under the regulations of the PRA that all the UK banks hold capital for interest rate risk on the banking book. A pretty sensible thing to do uh, given the current situation, but just the fact that, that it may, government bonds may be risk-free, but but they do um, pose interest rate risk. They're also subject to the liquidity requirements under Basel III. Um, this the structure of the bank's um, balance sheets are quite different from SVBs and other, and other banks that, that, came, um, that had trouble. Less reliance on hold to maturity assets, uh, don't have the same really high dependence on, on, um, on uninsured deposits. So, you know, that was, that was, a, that was a good story. Um, but rising interest rates might not have triggered a risk in the, in, or a vulnerability in the banking system, but it certainly did materialize in non-bank financial intermediation. And that was with liability-driven investment funds that are used by pension funds uh, that came under severe stress when interest rates spiked. And I'll talk about that spike in a minute. But what happened is that it prompted the Bank of England, uh, and I was there at the time, to intervene with a temporary and targeted asset purchase plan, with gilts, basically long term, to respawn market functioning. And that's sort of most obviously needed if you want the transmission of monetary policy to work. Uh, but at the same time, it was, came at a really awkward moment when monetary policy was, was tightening. So just a little sidebar on liability-driven investment. I bet you don't wake up every morning thinking about it. So, so um, it, it's just an investment approach that's used by pension schemes to match the sensitivity of the scheme assets to its liability, its liabilities uh, that are driven by you know, interest rate uh, and inflation. And what the, the leverage uh, LDI actually allows you to do is retain some of their assets and growth seeking assets, particularly important for pension funds to find benefit funds that are underfunded. And in the UK case, they used uh, leverage through repos and swaps. And so 
it's pretty big, uh, 1.4 trillion pounds at the end of 2021, so not a small um, piece of the pie in the UK. And, and so I think in this, go through this really fast because of the picture paints a thousand words. You can see starting in September, uh, that's just uh, real and nominal 30-year uh, gilts that, that yes, they were rising somewhat with the expectations of tightening of, int uh, of uh, interest rates and, and potentially QT, which was well, um, was well telegraphed, but it was really on, on uh, that Friday, uh, September 23rd, when the government introduced a mini budget called the growth budget, that, that things went awry. And so what we saw between the 23rd and the 28th of September was a blowout in interest rates of the order of 130 basis points on the, on the nominal end, and uh, linkers were up by, by even more. And what you read in the papers was really what was going on, is that investors were really concerned about the government's commitment to fiscal prudence. But there was more than that. There was also concerns over the prospects of forced deleveraging in the fire, going through fire sales um, of gilts by LDI funds. And so it leads me to my first lesson, which is market forces are there. Uh, those often are triggers, they're unpredictable, uh, they're merciless, and they're especially merciless when you have uh, poorly managed risk. So clearly, usually higher interest rates are actually good for pension funds, especially those who aren't levered because it just reduces the present value of, of uh, its, um, of its uh, liabilities more than, than it declines in the assets. And so, um, but when there's leverage, it's problematic. And so uh, you all know this, if you're, in a div if you're undertaking repos of derivatives, you're gonna have collateral and margin calls. Those turned out to be really big. That's what you see in the chart. Uh, the very first downward spike just on the day that, that we started to intervene was in the order of 66 billion pounds. Uh, and so there was no activity going on really in markets, a very small amount. And part of the reason was, was um, that people knew that this sharp increase in re yields was gonna, was gonna uh, materialize in the LDI space, and it was in, in repo and, and margin calls, but also in a reduction uh, in the net asset value, so an increase in le leverage of these funds. And so if, if the funds aren't willing or they can't take higher leverage, they only have two choices. Either they're, they get um, more cash or uh, they're forced to sell the assets. And so, um, and so, Really, the shortcomings that that were exposed in this was really the fact that, well, two things. One, the leverage, the, these these LDI funds. Of course, they had they had excess cash there to buffer shocks, but it was much bigger than what they'd planned for. And the Bank of England had done uh, an exploratory scenario where they, you know, imagined a hundred basis point increase in uh, yields level shift in the yield curve over a very short period of time, but the shock was just much bigger. The other, the other flaw in what had been done was they assumed that the operational capacity was there to raise the necessary cash from the pension funds or the pension schemes uh, in, in the amount of time that was needed, basically a day. And, and uh, of course that wasn't possible for reasons that we don't need to get into except for the fact that Many of the problems were in pooled uh, funds that, that had you know, hundreds and hundreds of trustees of different pension funds who did not have the operational capacity uh, to react quickly. So both assumptions in, this, in these examinations that had been done by the Bank of England turned out to be wrong. And I think that that, that brings us to, um, to uh, the second lesson, which is, uh, you know, the stress tests really do need to include scenarios. We always say plausible, uh, but severe, but sometimes they need to be hypothetical scenarios that have never happened, especially in a world that's so unpredictable. Uh, we also need to model the interconnections uh, between not just the, the LDI, but the rest of the system, which turned out to be uh, quite strong. Uh, mortgages ended up being canceled or not being written uh, because of it, uh, because of the disruption in markets. So, 
Operational resilience, again, it's a pretty mundane thing to be thinking about, I suppose, uh, for some regulators, but it's something that, that uh, they recognize is, is important. That's why the Bank of England's actually doing a system-wide exploratory exercise that's trying to increase our capacity to do this kind of stress testing. It's not um, the data and just the modeling to be able to do it is, is not uh, at the place we would, we would like it to be. So, um, so the issue was, here we are, intervening, buying guilds, and you know, the, the immediate thing was, well, how is this different from, from uh, you know, QE, in a sense? I mean, the day before the Bank of England, the, the, the budget was announced, the, the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee had just announced a 50 basis point increase in interest rates, and that they were starting actual sales as part of their QT program the month afterwards. And so, and so it seemed to be at odds. But if you look at this table, and I, I don't have time to go through it so carefully, you can see that actually the, the operations were quite different along many dimensions, whether it's the objectives, the, the financial stability operation was to restore, um, to break this self-reinforcing spiral in, in the margin calls, in the pricing of, in the gilt market. A QE objectives are, you know, related to their inflation target. The governance was different. It was the FPC committee that, that recommended some action. Uh, the MPC is the one that, that uh, takes decisions on quantity targets. The, the, um, the operation was temporary. We said right from the get-go, 13 days. The reason it was 13 days is that's what we figured pension funds needed to actually be able to operationally come up with the, 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 the capital that they needed. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't have that. Uh, it was that they needed time. Uh, we ended the program when we said we would, even though there was pressure not to. Uh, they were targeted. We only bought the bonds that were in the, in the area that was causing trouble. Um, and so we had backstop price, pricing that meant that, that uh, it was a backstop facility. It wasn't a facility like QE where you say, I'm going to buy, I have a target for the number of bonds I want to buy. And at the end of the day, we just bought just under 20 billion of gills, which was much smaller than the capacity of the program. And so there was just so many reasons that, that these were different. And if you look at market pricing, especially pricing with respect to inflation expectations, you see no sign that, that uh, this differentiation uh, was, wasn't credible. So the other thing that doesn't happen in QE is, is regulatory follow-up or follow-up. And so uh, the FPC recommended quite shortly afterwards uh, to the entity that regulates these LDI, the pension funds, uh, that they needed to increase their resilience in a number of dimensions. So I'm just going to claim that, that, uh, that it worked. If you look at the market pricing afterwards, interest rates came out a little bit uh, higher than they, went, they were um, before the whole, the whole uh, crisis began, but the functioning of mar markets was restored. We were able to sell the bonds that we had purchased as planned by mid-January 2023. Uh, the thing that really, that really uh, impressed me was that the backstop part, part really worked because a lot more bonds were sold into the market. They could absor absorb it. We only took up part of that. And you can see that in the dotted line of the chart, which is less than the total amount that, that, was, that was sold. So I think one of the lessons, uh, this is just a chart that just shows, shows how small uh, this was relative to the overall QE. And I, I think the, the lesson that I, that I take from it is that it is possible to do financial stability operations that support monetary policy without, without uh, changing the stance of monetary policy in any meaningful way. But to do that, it, they, have to be, they have to be targeted, they have to be temporary, and the backstop pricing is pretty important. Um, and so um, I, guess, I guess the last thing I'd like to say, this is just some summary of my lessons. I didn't, I didn't uh, talk a lot about the central bank liquidity facilities. 
we, we managed to do some preparatory work that allowed us to deploy the one that we did very quickly uh, because we had been thinking about liquidity and the interaction with margin calls in advance. Um, but that doesn't mean that the story is over. NBI, NBFI is, um, is causing all kinds of different risks in the system and I think that we need to, and the Bank of England does need to review its facilities. And the last lesson, which, which is maybe in um, slight disagreement with some of the other comments, is that I think that the Bank of England's uh, governance uh, arrangements actually helped with this coordination and this, and at least in a narrow sense in this instance, made it really clear what financial stability policy does and what monetary policy does. And that delegation of authority, part of its le legislative, uh, having these separate committees that are thinking about different things, but there's a governance about how they're supposed to interact was success, was, was just really important to how we, to, to how we were able to, um, keep this intervention contained. And so I'm um, happy to talk more about that, but uh, I'm not claiming that accountability and transparency couldn't be improved, uh, but at the same time, I think that we need to be, we need to be, um, recognize things when they're working well. Thank you. So what I propose we do is uh, we'll take uh, three or four questions, uh, give uh, opportunity for some responses, then take uh, a few more questions. I'm mindful that uh, our questions and answers are between us and lunch. Uh, so we'll ask that if you're making a comment that this is like Jeopardy, it comes in the form of a question. John Cochran. I am for the, John Cochran, Hoover. Uh, for the first time in my life, I have a short question, uh, and it's for Daryl. Um, uh, you gave the story, the lovely story about the poker chips, um, but I, it's hard. We're talking about a trillion poker chips now, and back before 2008, we got along with about 10 billion poker chips, and I'm curious what happened. Now, I heard from earlier work of yours, part of the problem was the Fed required us to hold nine of the poker chips in our pockets, so they don't work anymore. To, to what extent is the liquidity requirements uh, problem there? And second, we used to have intraday overdrafts, I don't know if we still do, which, which removes this whole time of day business. Is, is that gone, or is that a, a good thing to bring back, or, or what happened here? Okay. I see another hand here in the back. Thank you. I would love to, this is Axel Merck. I would love to have maybe um, Amita and uh, Carolyn have a little argument here because I somehow heard opposing views. When I hear um, targeted and temporary, but institutionalizing that, that in the US we call that a Fed put to not have a disincentive, to have a disincentive actually to get your house in order. And I wonder, you, you, you pointed out, we need to do more financial modeling. Well, it will never be possible to model everything. And I think one of the reasons, at least in the US, why the small banks have these issues is because there are so many regulations and they have limited resources. So they forget to look at the forest from all the trees because they try to cross all the T's. And they are the, the more simplified version of having maybe less regulation and empower slash halt management responsible, including the potential failure of the businesses, whether that might not be the better approach than doubling down on the, um, on the financial stability operations, as you very nicely call it, but I'm afraid that might just turn out to be a micromanagement of the economy. Okay. Mickey Levy. Ahmed, I have a question about um, your, your empirical work that says, okay, higher capital required by banks, and then you get, uh, response from non-banks. What data source are you using for non-bank lending? Um, I find that I hear tons of anecdotal evidence about non-bank lending, but we really don't have a good grip on how much it is. So I'm interested in your database and I wouldn't be surprised if you increase capital on banks and after a short period, total lending goes up. Uh, hi, <clears throat> Brian Sack from Bali Osney Asset Management. Um, question for Carolyn also. Uh, I, I do think the Bank of England did a remarkably good job separating out market functioning purchases from uh, QE purchases uh, and um, uh, 
you know, there had been work done at the BIS by Andrew with that, on that, and it was kind of neat to see that done in, in practice. I wanted to ask, though, so th this was a situation where the problem was, you know, pretty visible to you, pretty contained. It was a particular set of institutions. And I'm wondering, I mean, it's great to say we did it well in that instance, but I'm wondering, will that always be the case? I mean, I could imagine bouts of market functioning problems where it's really not clear what the problem is, and it involves a bigger set of market participants. I think 2020 uh, is a good example in U.S. Treasury markets. So I guess I'm asking, like, in these more complicated situations, how confident are you that you can separate that out? Thank you. I'm going to take two more questions, and then we're going to give a response. This gentleman here, whose name I can't see, so if you could tell us who you are, and then Michael Boskin. Hi, I'm <clears throat> Bill Nelson from the Bank Policy Institute, and these are all very interesting presentations, and I'd be happy to ask all of you questions, but I know Daryl will be disappointed if I don't ask him a <laughs> balance sheet question. So uh, it, it, it was clear to financial market participants starting at the end of 2018 that conditions were beginning to get tight. Uh, it was well known in advance that this was a tax day when there was going to be big payments out of money market funds into the TGA. It was well known that there were coupons, security settling that were going to require more repo funding. Uh, and the Fed used to know how to handle that situation when those situations were coming. They added a lot of reserves. So, I mean, isn't the solution not to stop with two or three hundred billion dollars above where you think you might need to go, but rather as you get closer just to control those swings? I mean. Luke Randall wrote a month before it happened that there was going to be a train wreck, and I wrote two weeks before it was going to happen that there was going to be a train wreck. So wouldn't that, you know, given that there are costs to size, isn't it better to explore that lower limit by controlling volatility and reserve balances? Michael Boskin. I just want to ask a general question that reflects almost everything that's been said all day today. We've been talking about central bank independence, separation or integration of supervision and regulation and financial stability for monetary policy. Uh, we haven't, we've had some, especially in the Latin context, a discussion of the fiscal pressures, and of course with John Cochran here, we of course have to emphasize that. But we haven't heard a lot about the, uh, uh, the integration of the central bank balance sheet and the treasury's balance sheet. And uh, well, we're forcing all these people to take mark to market or giving them a pass from it. Uh, the Fed used to be a very large supplier of uh, tax revenue to the Treasury, and we haven't talked much about the risk to independence if it ever becomes widely perceived about the capital losses on the long-term bonds and uh, mortgage-backed securities where we've kind of shifted the duration risk uh, uh, from the... Uh, we shifted basically the Federal Reserve as... Uh, dealing with it right now. Okay. So let me uh, give the panelists an opportunity to respond and, and do it in the order in which they presented and um, start with Amit Saru and then, and, and then uh, Daryl Duffy and then Christina Paterhone Skinner and then Carolyn Wilkins. Amit. All right, uh, thanks uh, for great presentations and also questions from the floor. So I'll, there, were, there are many questions and everybody has a lot to say. So I'll, I'll just say a couple of things because I agree with what was said about trying to model all kinds of scenarios. I'm an engineer myself, so my tendency is to model, but I also remember what uh, late Bob Lucas taught us about the Lucas critique, and I think that applies very heavily in this setting. Uh, we have enough evidence. I think all we are saying is, if you look at private credit, look at private equity, there is skin in the game, and you want some more skin in the game. That's it. It's not very complicated. and. You saw that picture, all the banks have 90% debt. Write me some models which tell you that across the size distribution, that's the optimal leverage ratio. Uh, it'll be really hard. Uh, the answer is they, a lot of them just eat subsidies. And so we don't need a complicated model. We know exactly how to deal with that. On the non-bank uh, lending data, that's a, actually a big part of uh, uh, a plea that we are trying to make, me and my collaborators, that if you look, we have a great set of call report data for banks. Non-banks, you've got to look at different segments, consumer credit, mortgages, and so on. That was the reason that when we ran our first set of counterfactual experiment was in the mortgage market. There you can track it. With call reports, 
with fund, uh, uh, flow of funds data, it's a little bit more complicated. You can't get very granular, but you can still run aggregate experiments. Uh, so I think, and the Fed losses, Mike, I agree, that's a big deal. Actually, the losses are even larger for Fed. I mean, it's more than what I showed you for the banking system, and it's, a, it's an issue. But I let others chime in. Daryl. Okay, I'm going to start with John's question because it goes right to the heart of uh, this panel's mandate uh, connections between financial regulation and monetary policy. After the financial crisis, uh, Congress really got religion about banks relying only on themselves to meet their liquidity needs. And a uh, raft of new regulations implementing Congress's wishes required banks to have enough liquidity for essentially any circumstances, even including the need for them to be wound down in a failure. No reliance on a lender of last resort, so forget discount window overdrafts, they had to have enough on their own. And so implicit in your question, they stashed up a lot of liquidity for any circumstance and they never wanted to reduce below that required amount of liquidity because their supervisors would have written them a note that would have gone to their CEO and uh, the Fed uh, and the CEO would have been very disappointed at people managing those balances. So we had what is sometimes called the last taxi problem. Lots of liquidity was there, but the banks weren't uh, willing to use that liquidity when the opportunity uh, came about, and they weren't able to fund other banks that were in need of liquidity. Uh, that was the major change in, in regulation, and there's lots of, you know, we can cite all the specific regulations on resolution planning and uh, uh, liquidity stress testing and the whole nine yards. And this is not the LCR, which is 30 day. These re regulations require that in any circumstance within a single day, a bank must meet all of its li liquidity needs. Uh, Mickey's question, uh, Aren't bank regulation, aren't uh, capital, higher capital buffers going to end up uh, with banks providing more liquidity, not less? And the answer is yes, risk based capital buffers, the more the better in terms of providing liquidity. However, there's this wrinkle in capital regulations called leverage rules. In the US, it's called the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio, which doesn't pay any attention to risk. So even something as safe as a deposit in the central bank requires the same amount of capital under that rule as a risky real estate loan. And so when those uh, regulations are binding, banks are averse to providing uh, liquidity in these funding markets, even though they're essentially perfectly safe uh, treasury-backed overnight loans. So that's a very unfortunate part of regulation. Uh, where, where did we get the data? I mean, uh, I visited, uh, thanks to John Williams' invitation, he's here today, the New York Fed last year. We have access, or we had when I was there, access to all of the uh, intraday, uh, sorry, the intraday uh, Fedwire uh, transactions and the repo transactions uh, conducted uh, by, the, uh, by the commercial banks. On Bill Nelson's question, uh, yeah, I and mean, I was one of the people that was suggesting that the airplane was getting a bit low, don't know where the runway is, maybe we shouldn't try to get any lower. Uh, the Fed did put out a survey to uh, all of the large banks saying, in the worst circumstances, how much reserves would you actually need to meet your needs? And they responded to the Fed, around 800 billion. There was about 1.5 trillion in the system at that time. And so the Fed assumed that it was fine. This was the first major reduction in its balance sheet post-financial crisis. So, you know, maybe the, the Fed uh, might have been more risk averse uh, as it is today, I believe. Uh, but at the time, it was relying on what it thought was reliable data. And uh, it, it, it basically, it got it wrong, despite uh, some signals that were available. 
Uh, that's that's it. That's for Christina my Christina Paterholm Skinner. Um, yeah, so I'll just briefly touch on the last question that was posed. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess I'll take the opportunity to plug another paper that I wrote with Andy Levin, who is here today. And we, in this, in this paper, sort of argue that the fiscal consequences of the way that the Fed uses its balance sheet today, um, particularly in connection with QE, but generally just its limitless ability to issue short-term liabilities that are backed by the full faith and credit of the government, sort of bank reserves, and also repos has been sort of by default systematically excluded from most regular forms, all really regular forms of congressional oversight, which Congress uses to sort of monitor the both their performance and sort of the impact on the um, public fisc uh, associated with all other major independent agencies. And so we try and call attention to the need for greater public debate and more congressional scrutiny of this question. And I think the same thing applies to this question of have we entered a world in which we have uh, two parties in the US government acting as debt, uh, debt managers and how is that being coordinated, if at all, and whether the central bank should have a role in, in debt management? So. Carolyn Wilkins. Yeah, so, so um, I think the, the, the comment was, why do we spend time thinking about tools instead of thinking about what's getting in the way of reducing the vulnerabilities in the first place? And maybe <coughs> complexity in the regulatory system is getting in the way. I would say that, um, yeah, we need to look at that too. And that's why uh, we've, done, we've done a few things. Uh, the Bank of England on the, on the prudential side has got a, an exercise called Strong and Simple, which is basically looking at uh, the regulatory regime for smaller banks, thinking about what actually makes sense for them and what can we, what can we simplify in a way that you know, keeps safety but reduces reduces uh, the burden, which may take away from thinking about risk in a in a more fulsome way. The, the Financial Policy Committee we have a dual mandate that says, well, financial stability first, but you need to take into account the net benefits and and you need and the costs. So the costs, uh, especially to broader objectives of innovation and and uh, growth in the UK economy. And those aren't just words. We, um, I, last year or the year before, we eliminated one of our, our, um, our tools in the, in the mortgage market. Uh, we have the LTI and the, and the limit and the affordability, which is basically a test of you know, interest rate rises. And we, we found in our research that in fact that one was superfluous. So we, we uh, dropped it. Uh, so I think there are ways to do both. I, I don't think that simplifying is enough because sh thinking about reducing vulnerabilities, but shocks are still going to happen, and they're not in the control necessarily of the central bank or anyone for that matter. And so we need to be prepared to respond to those, and that takes, if you want to do it well, it's best you've thought of the principles in advance. Um, just quickly on the balance sheet and you know, the interaction with fiscal policy, I, I couldn't agree more that there are really important questions to, to resolve there. Um, you know, in some countries, like Canada and the UK, any QE exercise or any purchase exercise that, that involves risk to the balance sheet, indemnities are sought. And it's not necessarily because you have to, it's just that it's recognized that that has potentially fiscal consequences. Uh, I think the bigger uh, and more gnarly issue is related to thinking about the real net benefits of QE relative to potentially some other kind of response, and that includes fiscal policy. And the optimal fiscal monetary policy mix is, is an interesting academic exercise, but it's a really, really tricky um, public policy exercise when you, what you'd like to have is independence of both fiscal policy and monetary policy. Thank you. Let me thank the organizers of this conference, John, John, and Michael, for uh, uh, putting together this fascinating panel and uh, to also let you all know that lunch is served. <laughs>